Like most U.S. cities at the turn of the 20th century, San Francisco was filled to the brim with many people packed into one-room apartments. One of those people was a young inventor named William Lawrence Murphy, and his tiny apartment was a big problem. He had fallen madly in love with an opera singer and was desperate to court her. But the moral and legal codes of the time meant it would be improper to bring her into his bedroom. But his apartment was only a bedroom. And so, engineer that he was, Murphy wondered if he could somehow transform his bedroom into something else. What if he could hide that bed somehow? Murphy attached the bed to a hinge inside his closet and pushed the mattress up, and the Murphy bed was born. By the 1920s and 30s, the Murphy bed had become a status symbol that developers use to attract residents. It soon spread like wildfire across America, in real life and on screen. The bookcase of my day is a bed by night. From the Marx Brothers to Mickey Mouse to Bob Hope, the Murphy bed became a comedic sidekick. Always misfunctioning. That's a nervous bed. It works by itself. And trapping people inside of them. Not even James Bond was safe. We've had some interesting times together, Ling. I'd be sorry to go. The Murphy Bed's popularity waned after World War II as people left cities for the green lawns and spacious homes of the suburbs. But today, cities around America once again find themselves packed to the brim. So can we update the Murphy Bed for the 21st century? Here we are in front of the Ori Square, okay. which is the Ori interface. Yep. Oh, well, here comes the bed. And it's not going to squish us no, into the know. wall. <laughs> and there's, there's, of course, you know, safety sensors. So yes. If it senses force, you basically stop. That's the CEO of Ori, Asier Larrea. The Ori Studio Suite is a new kind of Murphy bed. With the push of a button or a simple voice command, it can just disappear. A Murphy bed is easy to transform, but it's not effortless. Meaning, when you need to transform a Murphy bed, you have to take out the pillows. And now you have to make the bed. Mm -hmm. Now you have to put some straps so that the linens don't fall. Right. And that's why robotics are important, because that's what gives you that effortless experience. And that gives you that feeling of finally a space adapting to us mm. instead of us adapting to a space, which is how it's been for centuries. So this is a robot bed. Yeah, but it's not just a robot bed. It's also a partition unit and a closet, and you can push it up against the wall to create this much bigger living room. Or you can move it into the middle of the studio, and then you've transformed one room into two rooms. You actually have two offices, a full walk-in closet, a bed, and an entertainment area, all in one piece. So it's like a Swiss Army knife. Did you bring one back to New York for me? Well, uh, right now, Ori is mostly marketing the studio suite to developers. But they have started working with IKEA on a more affordable consumer version. And Asier thinks that if that takes off, it really could make a difference for people living in small spaces. When you look at an apartment, one of the first things you ask is, where is the square footage? Mm -hmm. What technology is going to do is going to totally change that. And it's going to prove that a 300 square feet apartment, just to give you an example, could feel much better and much larger than a 500 square feet apartment. This idea of making more with less could help address one of the most pressing challenges facing cities today. Welcome to City of the Future, a podcast from Sidewalk Labs. Each episode, we explore ideas and innovations that could transform our cities. We're your hosts. I'm Vanessa Quirk. And I'm Eric Jaffe. In this episode, we're talking about ideas that will not only improve the physical spaces we live in, but the way we live in them. Affordability by design. One thing that hasn't changed since Murphy's day is that urban space is limited and expensive. In fact, the problem has just gotten worse. In the U.S. and, and most countries around the world, really, local and federal governments have traditionally played the most important role when it comes to creating and delivering affordable housing, especially housing for lower-income households. In 2015, New York City had a contest to incentivize the private sector to help them chip away at this issue. And in this case, it was by building a new housing type that the city was lacking. Small, beautiful studios. We like to say that we increase the size of everything except for the square footage. That's Eric Bungay. He's part of a team at N Architects, the architecture firm that won the contest and designed a micro-unit building called Carmel Place. 
I actually got a tour of Carmel Place when it opened, and it was really impressive how airy and pleasant the studios feel. The square footage is small, but the ceilings are high, the windows let in a ton of light, and what I didn't know at the time is that a lot of what was shrunk down was stuff I never would have noticed. We can scrutinize every single thing. What is the performance of a door? It has to block Mm -hmm. sound, it has to provide a fire separation. Mm -hmm. Well, what if it were three millimeters thick? That's probably too thin. But why don't we scrutinize those things that add up? Floor assemblies, ceiling assemblies, Mm -hmm. all the things that are invisible that take up probably 10 to 15% of our home can be captured spaces Mm -hmm. that we can actually give back to residents if we rethink everything. So one of the ways to make 300 square feet feel like 500 square feet is by shrinking invisible architectural elements. Mm -hmm. But shrinking is just one of the concepts that Eric and his team use when they're designing this type of urban housing. Another one is sharing. You can start to organize units to share one small common area, but is there an even smaller grain? Like, you don't have to throw something out, you can throw something to somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's not Maria Kondo, but we're now able to share in a much more intelligent and precise way. So if you share kitchen equipment, for example, you don't need as big a kitchen anymore. Right. And the last design concept is transforming. Imagine like a table or a desk that you could fold up and turn into a wall. Anything become a wall if you fold it up. And so we could think about housing as a framework that provides space and allows for flexibility. I think we should be planning for the unknown. We're trying to push this even further with our proposal for a neighborhood of the future along Toronto's eastern waterfront. I'm trying to get us beyond pure square footage as a core metric for Mm -hmm. housing cost and price, but rather just quality of space and thus quality of life for me as the resident. That's Annie Koo, Associate Director for Development at Sidewalk Labs. She's spent her career in the private and public sectors trying to make housing more affordable. She originally went to school for architecture, but that didn't last long. I got very frustrated when I realized that architecture was about building for mm, primarily people who can afford to live in well-designed homes. And so it was sort of fascinated by affordability by design and what that looked like. Mm -hmm. And that took me to housing. Mm -hmm. So affordability by design. Can you break down that concept for us? So affordability by design is at its core this concept of reducing unit size because that's critical for enhancing affordability. Right. I mean, we've talked about this before. It's like with smaller apartments, developers can create more total apartments than they normally would. And more total units means more affordability for a city. Yeah, but we think about it as far more than just that. Affordability by design, as we define it, is important to actually increase the quality of the spaces. It's about rethinking space and making sure that it's a fit for our families, for households. Mm -hmm. So it's not shrink, it's rethink. Yeah. It's about expanding the shared spaces within a building. It's about a floor plan that allows you to grow into a one-bedroom and actually sync up the hallways or interior corridors that allow you to do that. And with things like on-demand storage and like robotic furniture, I want to rethink the unit so that it's distilled down into just what someone wants. Okay, so it sounds like affordability by design isn't just one thing. It's a lot of different things that together will make a smaller unit feel like a more comfortable home. So let's talk through some of the the ones you just mentioned in more detail. And let's start with flexible furniture. Yeah, sure. So say I'm Annie and all I care about is... (laughs) Say. Sorry. (laughs) Let's just say. Imagine you're Annie. (laughs) And all I care about is the kitchen. But like... Eric cares mostly about his living space because he hosts raging parties. <laughs> There's one going on right now. <laughs> so imagine if you could have something that's flexible that comes into your space that can help Eric expand his living space, but also convert back into a kitchen if need be. Or Annie takes it and it really expands my kitchen counter space, but can fold up into a living room as needed. You also mentioned something that goes beyond furniture. You mentioned flexible floor plans. Yeah, it could be like, how do you create future-proofed floor plans that allow you to use flexible walls to grow or shrink units? So the flexible walls are a super cool idea that we will return to in a future episode. But the bottom line for housing is that these walls would allow your apartment to evolve and fit your needs. Often families move out to the suburbs, move elsewhere to seek more space. But if you're able to grow or shrink your unit on demand, would you be more likely to stay in the city for the life of your home and your family? Another thing you mentioned is this idea of on-demand storage. 
Yes. We are imagining this housing model where you can have off-site on-demand storage. Can you store some of the things that you don't use on a day-to-day basis in a cheaper square footage further off-site? Such as all my party equipment. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the DJ turntables. <laughs> yeah, that are being used right now, apparently. But, but wait, off-site storage, like what does this mean? No closets? My vision is actually, could the off-site storage be delivered directly to your closet at any given time? But how do you get it instantly? This sounds like magic. Robots. Oh, the delivery robots! <laughs> yeah. Season one, episode four. So I could store all of my special cooking gear most of the year and then have a delivery robot just instantly bring it to me when I have a big holiday party. Yeah. We also think that sharing certain amenity spaces like a kitchen or a dining space that lets you truly have that massive dinner party that you want without Mm -hmm. reserving that only in your space and used once a quarter or once a year is something that folks would want to sign up for. Or a guest room. Or a guest room. I think that's one of the most important ones, actually. It's a way to both right-size housing units so you live in what you need and what you actually want versus buying that extra two-bedroom simply because every Mm -hmm. Christmas or holiday season, my family might come in and visit. And that's just not the most efficient use of space. I think today, in many ways, you have to overbuy or overrent space in order to afford choice. But with affordability by design, you're able to say, I want that extra kitchen in a shared space, but I don't necessarily have to pay for it in my personal unit. And so it affords you more choice in that way. I'm just not sure how many Americans will go for sharing a kitchen. I mean, I think of a lot of Americans, they would take the private space over the shared space every time. Well, not necessarily. Co-living is a shared living experience that's focused on convenience, great spaces, and a really strong sense of community. We didn't really have to focus that much on furniture, looking for different uh, roommates, and even just what to do in the neighborhoods. And they have this huge, beautiful rooftop where you can go all the time. We have Sunday night family dinner at We Live, followed by Monday morning breakfast at at WeWork. It It never ends. There are a whole host of co-living companies that have sprung up over the last few years. There's Common, Ollie, Quarters, Outpost Club, Dwell, Tribe, Rumors, and that's Rumors, Node, and those are just the ones in New York. Well, I did not know that. Yeah, and this is sort of a great failure of my life, but like, I did not predict co-living. Annie studied abroad in Denmark, where she researched co-housing, which is the inspiration for the phenomenon of co-living. In Denmark, it was framed as maybe max 10 families realizing that they wanted more communal living. And so they would build shared kitchens and eat dinner together every night. And so I was fascinated by this. And my whole thesis was about how, like, Americans will never take to co-housing because it's so sort of fundamentally different from our vision of private housing Mm -hmm. and what we believe to be true about the American dream. So that was what I wrote my whole thing about. Yeah, I mean, even just a few years ago, it would have been hard to believe it, but shared housing is a thing now. Well, co-living didn't bring shared housing to the U.S. I mean, our cities have had SROs going back to the time of the Murphy bit. Yeah, SROs refers to single-room occupancy, a worker-style housing that was meant to house workers cheaply and efficiently so they could be close to their jobs. It wasn't quite equivalent with the tenements, but similar in that they were just unsanitary, unhealthy, people crowding into spaces. Considering that history, I'm surprised that co-living developments are taking off right now. Mm, But they do have some key differences from SROs. To understand what co-living is exactly, we decided to talk to someone who's making it happen. I actually grew up in communal housing. My dad and mom moved out from the East Coast in the 1960s to the heart of San Francisco, North Beach, right where we're sitting. That's John Deshotsky. These days, he's the CEO of Star City, a development company bringing co-living to San Francisco. A city, of course, that's having a particularly hard time with housing right now. People are commuting an hour or two outside of the city. They're fitting four people to a two-bedroom by putting a wall up in the living room and calling that a room. Or they're paying 70% of their income towards rent in new construction studio apartments. And all of those are really crappy options. And so we really set out to build a brand at a price point that's a lot more reasonable than anything else that's on the market that's being built new today. Most Star City developments are slightly below market rates. 
but an upcoming downtown development will include units as low as $800 a month. For comparison, the average cost for a studio in that area is over $2,500 a month. So who's living in these? We have an airplane pilot, a teacher, baristas, bartenders. The age range is between 20 and all the way up to 70, with the middle being that 30 to 40-year-old range. John says that Star City attracts two types of residents. One group is what they call the optimizers. For the optimizer, everything is always set up. What brings them in are the fully furnished units, the clean common spaces, the fast Wi-Fi. In addition to that, they can order premium services like dog walking, room cleaning, wash and fold, dry cleaning, all that sort of stuff. The optimizer is really just looking to be taken care of. The other type of person living at Star City is the communitarian. This is somebody who's like really excited about living with other people, really excited about feeling like there's a place that they belong. So maybe they've previously felt socially isolated and now they're really looking for community. And which one are you, a communitarian or optimizer? Well, as I've gotten older, I've become a little bit of an optimizer because I would prefer to not to do the mundane things that have to do with housing and actually enjoy the culture, the nightlife, the arts, and continue to build this company. Those regular household chores can sometimes get in the way of that. Okay, it sounds like Star City is taking care of the optimizers, but are they delivering community for the communitarians? Well, we had John hook us up with one to find out. I had no idea anything like this existed, so it was all totally, totally brand new to me. Don is a 43-year-old airline pilot who had lived in the suburbs for most of his life. After a divorce, he decided to move to San Francisco, which is where he discovered Star City. Moving to a brand new city without knowing anybody, I realized I wanted roommates. And so that's how I found this place, as I was looking on Craigslist for roommates. And then that's when I clicked on the website and got into a little bit more of the, the description. And that's what sold me as far as at least giving it a shot was it takes care of all the problems of having roommates and you just get all the benefits. So do you feel like you have a community now? Yeah, definitely. The people that I see on a real regular basis, yeah, we've definitely become good friends, enjoying the house together, you know, being able to come home from work and Mm -hmm. just have a a random game night or, you know, a random party night. It has definitely, I would say, even exceeded my expectations. Now that Star City has had some success with these smaller communities, they're expanding, and they'll soon open up the largest co-living development in the world in San Jose, California, an 18-story tall, 800-unit building. And John Deshotsky explained to me that the new building just doesn't fit into the city's existing zoning laws. We call it a vertical neighborhood. And so when we showed the city our plans, they're like, hmm, well, you could re-entitle this project as a hotel, you could re-entitle it as student housing. You could re-entitle it as a single room occupancy. And we were like, no, we don't like any of those. <laughs> so, okay, but technically, what does make you different from an SRO? When we build a building, 65% of the space is private residential. 20% is communal, beautiful kitchens and living rooms and workspaces. And then the other 15% is circulation, right? So hallways and elevator space. In an SRO, you have 95% private residential space, tiny hallways, and no communal areas. We think co-living as a product is a physical new form. San Jose asked Star City to collaborate with them to write a new kind of zoning just for co-living. And we were like, okay, (laughs) that sounds wonderful. And over a period of about six months, we worked with them on all the details. What's the parking ratios? What are the open space requirements? What are the inclusionary housing and below market rate fees that we have to pay? What's the transportation demand management program there? And all of these were really bespoke to a higher density living format. And so I think that as we look forward into the future, you're gonna see a lot of major cities Mm -hmm. start to adopt this type of zoning change because it fits a big need. That is pretty extraordinary that San Jose worked with them on that. I mean, all those details, the transportation plans, the parking, 
all those things have to be considered if something like co-living is going to work. Mm-hmm. It's, it kind of gets back to what we were talking about earlier. I mean, would people go for this? And I think the answer is yes, if you can provide these trade-offs, like, which is what city living is. When you accept a smaller space, you do it because you get all these shared opportunities and benefits. Right, and public spaces are critical to that too. I mean, cities have the power to use zoning to ensure that developers, co-living or otherwise, provide people with more ample public plazas or green spaces. Yeah, totally. I mean, according to Annie, thinking beyond the unit and expanding the public realm is a key part of affordability by design. It's really expanding the definition of home so that when you're purchasing or renting a unit, you're not just getting your personal private space, but also the other spaces that make up the quality of my housing, including the neighborhood, the building, the public realm. I really like this idea of expanding the definition of home because I think that for a lot of Americans for so many years, the dream has just been about saving up to own your own house. But that's not the only way to live. And as we've been talking about, there are a lot of different options that can fit people's needs. Right. But helping people to access that dream with the more traditional option that's just as important as creating new ones. Yeah, that, that is true. And in fact, Annie's been exploring a new way to give more people access to home ownership with sharing, believe it or not. Not sharing your stuff or your space, but sharing equity. On the spectrum of renting and owning, shared equity sits somewhere in the middle. The way we've been thinking about this is you kind of buy what you can and rent the rest. Mm -hmm. So that means it lowers your down payment and your all-in monthly cost can be equivalent to like a typical full mortgage payment or a rental in the same size unit. Mm -hmm. And if it's equivalent, then what's the upside? Say I owned 20% of my unit and then I left, I would take the appreciation on my portion that I own. So you actually can build some equity, hence the shared equity term, and build a stake in sort of that wealth creation piece over time. But it's a stake that is fit to you, even if you can't afford that full total down payment. This is a whole other category of housing affordability tools for both consumers and developers that we've thought about a lot here at Sidewalk. One of the most important parts of delivering housing affordability is thinking through the funding and financials and policy options that make it possible. Housing is really complicated. There's an entire ecosystem of players who are participating in housing, ranging from governments who are critical to provide the funding, yeah. creating the zoning, down to the builders and construction companies, yeah. down to the architects and engineers thinking about the experience of housing for residents. And no one player in that whole ecosystem mm-hmm. has enough of a stake in the whole pie to single-handedly create more affordability. So in our project in Toronto, First and foremost, we said, what is available from government to support on an affordable housing program? But then we said, what could the private sector do to participate in delivering affordable housing? So one of the things the private sector can do, we've already talked about, and that's affordability by design, which works by making more units in a given building. But we've explored another innovation that makes more buildings in a given time, factory-based construction. That is a huge lever to play. Kareem talked about this in our episode on Mass Timber from last season. If Kareem can crack the code on factory, that will be huge for affordable housing because accelerating the timeline for construction creates real value for developers. Mm. And a major reason that developers today keep building luxury condos is because it is the surest way for them to recover their costs. So with factory-based construction, developers can reliably complete more projects quicker. There's a couple ways this leads to more affordability instead of just more money for developers. First, government can say, we're going to raise the price of public land and we're going to take that extra money you're giving us and we're going to build more affordable housing. Or it can say, we're going to keep that price of land the same, but you have to build more affordable housing. And we know you can afford to do it because you've got that cheaper and faster method. The role of government can't be overlooked. Like, it is the role of the government to set requirements for a site and tax incentives or rebates and waivers to deliver more affordable housing because a mixed-income community is what we're looking for as a city. It's a complicated ecosystem. Government funding, support from private developers, financial tools for renters, all these levers play a part. Yeah, without all of these levers, you would get 
the same old communities that get built today, which is primarily luxury market rate condos, to achieve the level of choice that we envision for housing of the future, I deeply believe that we need to have and pull all of these different levers at once. So if we can pull all the levers, if we can create all of these housing choices that really open up all these affordable options for all kinds of people, what would that look like? Yeah, we want to hear about Annie's housing of the future. (sighs) Okay, here's what would happen. I'd be applying on this, like, fantastic, centralized application, and I could say, what I really care about is a kitchen. So I get a unit, I add in this furniture that allows me to expand my kitchen, and then suddenly I want to grow up and I want to build equity. So then I opt into this shared equity model, and then suddenly my family happens to grow or my parents move in with me, and, like, we pop out some walls, and then my whole unit expands, and I get rid of that extra big kitchen because then I just expand my kitchen, Mm. actually. Whew. The options are endless. And then I grow up and then I go into co-living. It's just like <laughs> choice would be what my building or neighborhood would look like. <laughs> Thank you for listening to City of the Future, a podcast from Sidewalk Labs. Your hosts are Vanessa Quirk and me, Eric Jaffe. We are produced by Benjamin Walker and Andrew Calloway. Mix is by Zach McNeese. And a special thanks to all of those who contributed to this episode. Aziel Larrea, Eric Bungay, John Dashotsky, Don Rowe, Annie Koo, and Johanna Greenbaum. Our art is by the great Tim Cow. Our music is composed by Adam James Levine Arity. If you want to hear more of Adam's work, you can check out his band, Lost Amsterdam, at amsterdamlost.com. To learn more about Sidewalk Labs, visit our website at sidewalklabs.com, where you can also subscribe to our newsletter at the bottom of the page. See you in the future.